I work in um, clinical research, um, looking at the, uh, the the therapeutic benefits of ketogenic diets for for uh, chronic disease. So a well formulated ketogenic diet means that it provides full nutrition. And since 1980, we've seen this astronomic increase in overweight and obesity to the point now in the United States, 78% of everyone over 18 is either overweight or obese. The way we measure ketogenic diets uh, clinically is by actually measuring the ketones in the blood. Um, so, so we measure on a daily basis the ketone levels and between, you know, we try and keep it above 0.5. High sugar in your blood is also highly inflammatory. Uh, and the other thing that's highly inflammatory in, in the Western diet or the, um, the, the standard global diet, as you called it, uh, are seed oils. I would definitely avoid seed oils because they're very high in omega-6 fatty acids and those are highly inflammatory. So if you're starting to get brain fog, that's not an aging thing. That's an inflammation thing. Uh, that's uh, Sorry, it's, a, it's an insulin resistant thing. Well, and an inflammation thing for that matter too. So. So um, uh, you, those things that happen that we say, oh, it's just part of aging, they do not have to happen. I mean, you're going to get some gray hairs like I have. You're going to get a few wrinkles if you've been out in the sun like I have. But you don't have to get obese. You don't have to hurt. You don't have to get diabetes and heart disease. Your blood pressure does not have to go up. Your blood sugar does not have to go up. Your lipids do not have to get out of range. All of that is happening primarily because of diet. Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carb and Fasting. Okay, today's guest is an educator, researcher, a health consultant. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia and a postdoctoral fellowship in comparative physiology from the University of uh, Cambridge. He's also the author with his, uh, well, he's the co-author or uh, uh, with his uh, wife, award-winning journalist, Dale Drury. So they're the author of the book, Bio Diet. Here's the full title, Bio Diet, the scientifically proven ketogenic way to lose weight and improve your health. Dr. David Harper, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Thank you. Pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, uh, Neri, and uh, welcome from the west coast of, Van uh, of Canada. Vancouver is where I am, and you're in Toronto. Uh, so uh, so we're kind of bi-coastal today. <laughs> we are, we are. Um, well, I've been trying to uh, to do this for a long time, mm -hmm. so um, I'm pleased we, uh, we finally arranged this. Um, Dr. Harper, may, may I call you David during the... Um... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, now my followers or people who follow this channel are familiar with the ketogenic diet. However, there are so many versions out there that it does get confusing for people, right? So how high is the fat? How low are the carbs? Is protein moderate? Is protein um, high or low or moderate? So it can get confusing. What is the ketogenic diet that you have formulated that you talk about extensively, obviously, in your book? Can we give right. a summary of it? Yeah, it's a great way to start, I think. Um, and it's a good question because, you know, uh, now that... Um, the ketogenic lifestyle more than a diet, but the lifestyle has become um, pretty common. Uh, I think the last data I saw was about one in 12 uh, in the United States. I mean, more of that data comes to the United States, so I often refer to American values, but so it would be similar in Canada. So about one in, uh, one in uh, sorry, one in eight people, about 12% of people uh, say they're on a ketogenic diet. Now, I don't know whether they are or not. Uh, I work in um, clinical research, um, looking at the, uh, the the therapeutic benefits of ketogenic diets for for uh, chronic disease. Specifically, the recent study we've just had a publication from uh, is for women with metastatic breast cancer. Um, but ketogenic diets have been used therapeutically for all kinds of conditions. Um, so we talk about a well formulated ketogenic diet. Uh, and this is uh, a term that was coined, first coined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Stephen Finney, 
uh, and I work with, uh, we're both uh, good friends and colleague of, of uh, Dr. Jeff Bullock, who's at uh, The Ohio State University. Uh, he may have been on your show, or I'm sure your, your, uh, fan, your, um, your, your watchers, listeners are, are aware of his great work um, uh, uh, on ketogenic diets. And so uh, I've partnered with uh, Dr. Bullock, uh, along with my colleague here at the BC Cancer Research Center, uh, Dr. Jerry Crystal, and we're, we did this um, collaborative study on, on, on breast cancer. So, so a well-formulated ketogenic diet means that it provides full nutrition. Um, and, and I actually teach nutrition science, and most people don't know that's what a balanced diet is. I, th I think some people think a balanced diet is, well, you know, I had a salad for an appetizer, so I'm going to have cheesecake for dessert. That's balanced diet or whatever, um, or a Coca-Cola or something like that. Um, no, a balanced diet is simply that it provides full nutrition. And, and then uh, what makes it ketogenic is the fact that the carbohydrate uh, uh, of the three macronutrients, they're just carbohydrates, fats, and, and proteins. Uh, the carbohydrate is very low uh, and uh, very, very much lower than what's recommended you know, by Health Canada, by um, the... Uh, by, in the U.S. by the National Institute of Health or whatever, which is a high-carbohydrate diet. That's what's been recommended, and I would argue causing a lot of problems. Uh, so really, you're replacing the, uh, the carbohydrate you're not eating with fats. And, and, uh, and it, uh, you know, as long as they're not trans fats, and we don't want you to eat too, too much of that, obviously, and that's been taken out of the food supply for the most part uh, in processed foods, um, so, so your diet could be as high, uh, for instance, Inuit in the north of Canada, their diet can be up to 90% of calories from saturated fat uh, and no health issues on that diet, by the way. Um, but typically to be in a state of nutritional ketosis, which means you've, you've, you've reached a state of ketosis, you're producing ketones that are, that are apparent in your blood um, you need to drop your carbohydrate level down to, it depends on the individual, but about, about less than 5% of your total uh, caloric intake. Um, so that leaves 95% for fats and proteins. And, and though there's no upper limit that's been established for a healthy amount of protein, um, you know, probably a range of 25 to 35% is, is, a, is, is a, a moderate to moderately high amount of protein. Um, if you go too far after that, too much protein, your body can't absorb it, and then it kind of tends to um, stay in your in your digestive system and cause cause issues there. Uh, and so, um, but that's rare that people get that much protein. It's fairly easy to get calories from fat because because fat doesn't have any water in it, so the cal calor calories there are very very dense. Um, so just using, you know, grass fed butter or olive oil or something like that, you can, in fact, if you looked at the average, the average diet, um, uh, which is around 2000 calories roughly per day, uh, if you wanted to get all of that from olive oil, it would only be about two thirds of a cup of olive oil would give you those 2000 calories. So it's very, very dense, uh, which is great. That's actually what you want is, is the least amount of weight for the most amount of calories that helps manage your weight. Wonderful. Um, you did talk about the Inuit diet. Let's move to the Inuit diet because um, we don't see chronic illnesses. Certainly among the traditional Inuits who are still eating their traditional diet, right? Correct. Yeah. So let's just make that very clear, right? We don't see many chronic illnesses. So what's their secret then? They're not growing vegetables. Let's put it out. So they're not growing grains. They're not even growing vegetables um, <laughs> uh, where they live. What are they eating? What is it in their diet that's making them free of disease, basically? Well, more or less free of chronic disease. I mean, on, on their traditional diet, which, you know, Inuit um, they eat a lot of seal and other uh, animals. You know, it's mostly animal fish as well. Um, there aren't a lot of, there's no, you know, I guess the answer to your question, the short answer is they're eating what I would say is a, is a, a natural human diet. And so there's a lot of debate about that. And, and um, uh, there's even a lot of suggestion today that, you know, eating a plant-based diet, and I don't even know what that means, is supposed to be healthier. Uh, but that's not 
a natural human diet. The way we evolved, um, if you look at uh, hominids, you know, for three or four million years, uh, we were omnivores. We could eat anything and digest pretty much anything. But our diet, in order to survive, was largely high uh, foods that have high energy content, which would be animal-based foods. And it seems like uh, probably humans evolved in around estuaries and ate a lot of fish uh, and then other you know, animals and so on that they would find a around. Um, they weren't domesticated, of course, at that point. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, we evolved into Homo sapiens and, and then the modern Homo sapiens, which is Homo sapiens sapiens, modern man, uh, was probably around, you know, 300,000 years ago. Um, and, and from that time till, till, till now, uh, only represents, you know, the, the time from which we've had agriculture and started growing grains and eating grains and so on is only maybe about about one or two percent of our whole existence as humans. So it's funny because sometimes when people are, um, you know, critical of, of ketogenic diets, they'll say, well, there's no long-term data on ketogenic diets. And I say, how do you think we got here as human beings? We got here eating a ketogenic diet because it was largely uh, animal based uh, and we'd eat fat, we'd eat, you know, nose to tail, eat everything we could, but it was a high fat diet um, and, and moderately high protein diet, very little carbohydrate. Uh, I mean, there would be times we would get honey, there would be times we would find uh, some berries and things like that. But we remember there was no agriculture, so there's no grains, there was no pasta, rice, you know, uh, potatoes, none of that was part of the normal human diet. Um, now, there are, of course, uh, various human cultures that have evolved to, to, uh, to, to use those foods. But if you look at going back to Inuit peoples up, up northern Canada, uh, on their traditional diet, those that eat their traditional diet, there is virtually no chronic disease. So they don't get obese. They don't get diabetes. They don't get cardiovascular disease. They don't get cancer. Uh, and they live long, healthy lives. I mean, they're much more likely to die from some sort of you know accident or injury or something like that than they are of chronic disease, um, and and that and there are other human populations that eat ketogenic diets that are mostly fish based or animal based. Um, there are several which we could call hunter gatherer or that's just their traditional way of eating, uh, and it's the same thing. They're very lean, uh, they're very healthy, they don't get chronic disease, they live long lives. Um, it's only when we introduced uh, agriculture and introduce grains as a way to a division of labor and the ability to transport and store and so on. This is what grains are good for. And they do have nutrients in them. Of course, they have proteins in them. There are oils in them. Um, and that will sustain us, but it's not going to sustain you in a healthy way. It's going to start to compromise your uh, body's metabolism over time if you eat, eat a high degree of carbohydrates in your diet. And I think that's exactly what we've seen uh, in, area in, in, um, in North America, in particular in the West. Uh, it was only about 1980 when we started telling people you should, you know, eat less fat and start eating more carbs. And, you know, and, and people did that. I mean, we call it the SAD, is stands, S-A-D stands for Standard American Diet. Now, that's a very high carbohydrate, very low fat diet. And since 1980, we've seen this astronomic increase in overweight and obesity to the point now in the United States, 78% of everyone over 18 is either overweight or obese. Uh, and in some subpopulations like Hispanic and black populations, it's even higher. It's even over 80% of the adults are overweight or obese. And, and then you get the the same sorts of um, chronic diseases associated with obesity or aggravated by obesity, which include cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and so on, all have much higher risk when you're when you're overweight or obese. So to me, they all go together. They're, they all have the same root cause. And, uh, and that cause is largely the high glycemic index, high carbohydrate diet that we've been told to eat by our policymakers that science in the last 20 years has now demonstrated is not healthy and there is an alternative, which is. And so um, so in my book, BioDiet, I say, you know, you, you, you can reduce your uh, risk of chronic disease over a lifetime, probably by about 70%. I mean, that's a bit of a back of an envelope guesstimate, uh, but by about two thirds, you can reduce your risk of chronic disease simply by changing to a healthier diet, which is a, which is a well-formulated ketogenic diet.
Yeah, um, I could so relate when you said uh, we're being advised by our health uh, organizations um, to eat grains, to base our diet on bread and and other products made of grains. Uh, it's the same for uh, for diabetics. Um, diabetes uh, UK, for example, um, that's that's UK's diabetes organization, similar to the American ADA. Mm -hmm. um, they recommend a wheat carb-based diet. Um, <laughs> well, they do. And, and, and the reason they do, uh, well, first of all, what's recommended is not supported by science. It never was. It was just a hypothesis that was never properly tested. Although you could argue that the last 40 years have been a giant experiment on the Western uh, Western world uh, to the eating a high carbohydrate diet, see what happens and everybody ends up obese and with uh, chronic disease. So the reason that the diabetics, and uh, to their credit, I believe the UK um, Diabetes Association, the Canadian Diabetes Association, the US, Australia was first, now recognize low carbohydrate diets as uh, as a good way to address type two diabetes in particular. Um, but what they say is, well, diabetes is associated with obesity. And so if we reduce obesity, we'll reduce diabetes. And that's probably true. But the problem is they're reducing obesity going down the wrong avenue. Uh, calorie restriction and, and taking fats out of your diet is not the best way to lose weight or keep it off. I mean, you can't, you literally can't maintain a calorie restricted diet because you're not getting enough calories. And it's very, very difficult to get enough nutrients in a calorie restricted diet to provide that full nutrition. So they're almost never balanced diet in the sense that they provide full nutrition. So, so, but you know, what's interesting is, uh, and I'd like, you know, your listeners think about this for a while is what, you know, what is this calorie we're always talking about? Now a calorie is, I have a glass of water here. A, a calorie is a unit of heat energy. So it's the amount of energy it takes to raise, you know, one cc of water by one degree Celsius. That's what a calorie is. It's it's amount of energy. Energy does not have weight. So if you're talking about obesity, you're talking about an increase in weight, and in particular, an increase in fat. So if you wanted to get the most calories with the least amount of weight, what you would want to eat is fats, mm -hmm. because they're the dense. They're twice as dense. So you actually want to eat more fat. But the way they looked at it with this unproven sort of hypothesis was that, well, since the fat on people's body is the same as the fat that they're eating, especially from animal products, uh, it must be the fat that they're eating that's making them fat. And that's something we just can't get people to get away from thinking, <laughs> from thinking that way. That's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. Now, if you have a, a high carbohydrate diet and you add fat onto that, that fat has nowhere to go and it's going to deposit itself in adipose tissue and it's going to be unhealthy for you. But if you actually remove the carbohydrate from the diet or most of it, then that's what you're burning is fat and you burn it constantly. So you, so you don't gain weight. So I, when I sort of had my eyes open to this world of ketogenic nutrition, it was about 15 years ago. Um, you know, I was never, I'm, I'm an av very average sized person, but I was about 170, 77, 78 pounds. I was not overweight, but just pushing up against that. I had a bit of a pot belly, a little bit, you know, my wife would say I'm kind of bellinaceous, you know, a little bit of a belly, um, which I talk about in, in the book too. But um, but when I uh, researched this and I devised the first version of the bio diet, the, the book, by the way, is based on the same diet we use in the clinic for our clinical studies. So it's very, very uh, scientifically supported Maybe. Can um, you hold the book up for uh Sure. For yeah, yeah. Hours? It's so, my well-thumbed author's coffee. Um, there we go. It's called Bio Diet. There's an egg on the front <laughs> for good reason. Uh, egg is a perfect food. There's no carbohydrate in an egg. It's just a protein and fat. And somehow from that, you get a whole chicken with 200 different tissue types. And um, so... Uh, um, uh, so that's the, uh, the, the, the sort of... Um, uh, approach people had was to say, well, if we reduce fat, then people will lose weight. If they lose weight, they'll have less diabetes. But that's actually not the right way to think about it. Diabetes is an, uh, an inability to properly metabolize carbohydrate. So when somebody is, you know, compromised the way they, they 
they uh, they metabolize carbohydrate. Getting them to more eat more carbohydrate is like putting out a fire by pouring gasoline on it. That's not the way you do it. <laughs> so it's just to me, that's just like common sense. Is is if somebody has a carbohydrate metabolism issue, don't give them more carbohydrate. Give them something else. And so in in some of the studies we've done, not me personally, but my colleagues, um, we've seen people that have been type two diabetic taking you know 100 units of insulin a day for 10 years. Um, and they'll go on a ketogenic diet and, and, and sometimes within just a few weeks, they need no insulin, uh, no metformin. They're off all their meds and their body reestablishes this natural way of metabolizing fats. And, uh, so I, that's why I say, if you look at those diseases, if you look at cardiovascular disease and so on, uh, we can see the reversal of the markers for cardiovascular disease. We can see changes in the immune system. That's what we look at, uh, that affect your ability to fight off cancer, uh, so, so the really great news, Nuria, is that um, uh, we have uh, an answer to the problem in our healthcare system, which is an aging population. And as we age, these chronic diseases we've discussed tend to be more, there's greater prevalence, greater insulin, incidence and prevalence of these chronic diseases. But we can prevent a lot of that uh, through proper nutrition. And, and uh, you know, I've been trying to get people at Health Canada to listen uh, to that fact. Like, instead of trying to find more ways to supply services to people who have chronic disease, why don't we work more on preventing them from getting it in the first place? Because we don't, we, in, in the West, we don't really have healthcare systems. We have disease management systems. So we wait till people get these chronic diseases, their blood sugar is too high, their blood pressure is too high or whatever they agree. And, and then we give them drugs and things to try and manage it. But it never gets at the root cause, which is dysfunctional metabolism due to poor diet. I like all the points you raised there. Um, um, I, I just wanted to add, when you mentioned the SAD diet, everyone knows the term now, the standard American diet. Uh, it was interesting because recently at a conference, Dr. Ben Bickman uh, yes. said, we should no longer call it SAD. It's no longer an American issue. It's a global issue. So now we should really call it standard global diet. Yes. And I can relate to it because we do a lot of traveling and wherever I go from North America to uh, South America, to the Middle East, to Europe, people are eating the same junk now. Um, so it is it is a global issue. So it's no longer um, exclusive to Americans. Uh, that was one note I wanted to make. But now um, you mentioned the percentages of calories. So a well-formulated ketogenic diet, what would it look like for a lay person? What could a plate look like? A well-formulated oh. well ketogenic diet. Sure. Um, well, I think people uh, often confuse it with the Atkins diet, which is a high protein diet, which may or may not be ketogenic, depending on what people are eating. I mean, the the way we measure ketogenic diets uh, clinically is by actually measuring the ketones in the blood. Um, so, so we measure on a daily basis the ketone levels, and between you know, we try and keep it above point uh, five, point uh, um, 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 five. Uh, the units differ between the US and Canada, which is why I'm stumbling a little bit. So let's just say 0.5 and 2, not worry about the units, um, depending on who your listeners are. But uh, And that's sort of the same units as you'd use for measuring uh, blood sugar as well. Mm -hmm. So people probably know, you know, you want your blood sugar on about, under about 7. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and I think that's around 200 in the American units. Um, and uh, I'll put the conversions on on the screen for our listeners. Sure. But the ketones are in uh, millimoles, so millimoles over. Uh, yeah, millimoles per microliter. Per is liter, the, that's, yeah. that's what we yeah. use in in outside the U.S. <laughs> um, in the U.S., they use this. I think they probably still measure ketones that way, but it trades off against glucose, sort of one to one. So the higher you get, get your blood ketones, the less uh, blood sugar you need. Um, and and uh, so uh, that's the clinical level of uh, ketones that we expect in the in the diet, and and uh, um, that is only achieved uh, when your when your carbohydrate levels are very low. Uh, so because if your carbohydrate, what people often don't realize is that bread and potatoes and rice is they're all just forms of sugar. 
We don't think of them as sugar because they're not sweet, but all it is is glucose, which is sugar just joined together. And when it gets longer, these molecules, we call them uh, glycogen uh, starches, you know, and, and glycogen is they don't, they don't taste sweet anymore. Um, and so we don't think of them as sugars, but, but when it's digested in your digestive system and then absorbed, it's absorbed uh, as, as, as sugar, as glucose. And, and so you do need glucose in your blood, but we have this amazing uh, system in our liver and to some degree in our kidneys called gluconeogenesis, which literally means making new glucose. So we can make all the glucose we need, uh, like other carnivores do, like cats and dogs and things. They just happily make glucose because you do need it for your nerve cells in particular. Um, uh, but you need you 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 can have all you need produced internally at just the level it should be all the time without eating any carbohydrates. So there are no essential carbohydrates. Fiber is not an essential nutrient. Um, there are two types of fiber, you know, soluble and insoluble. And, um, uh, and, and they're not necessarily bad things for your diet, but, but the other stuff, the starches, you know, gly glycogen, but all the starches and all the sugars generally should be avoided uh, as much as possible. And if you get that level down very low, um, then you can, then you're in a state of ketosis. So, so what my dinner would look like very much like anybody else's dinner, but there'd be no pasta, rice, potatoes. There's no starch on the plate. Uh, so there'd be vegetables on there, but no root vegetables because they're starchy. Um, so things that grow above the ground that aren't beans or grains. Um, and this is my, my cup of tea here has full fat, like whipping cream in it to, uh, uh, so I get those calories, uh, uh, where I can, they're, you know, high saturated fat calories. Um, I had, um, I was doing some rowing earlier and I, I had a little snack after the snack with something called chicharron, which is, uh, uh, it's a kind of, I think it's a Mexican name for, it's basically the pork skin with the meat chicharron con carne, it's the meat underneath that's, that's fried in, in lard, it's fried in, in pork. And that's snack food for me. You know, that's what I eat instead of a bag of potato chips. And it's much healthier for you. <laughs> Surprisingly, people might look at that and go, oh my God, you're going to have a heart attack. And you go, no, I, I literally just had my blood work done. And I've been doing this for 15 years. My blood work is absolutely crystal clear. I have very low triglycerides. My uh, All my uh, cholesterol levels are very, very much within the normal range. I have very high, good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. Um, and I've been doing this for 15 years. So by all accounts from the sad model, I should be, should have died of a heart attack years ago, you know, but uh, some, <laughs> so, I mean, from an individual perspective, one of the things we've learned from our particular research and many, many others have also shown is there's no harm in trying a ketogenic diet at, with some exceptions. So in my book, in the first part of part two, there are a list of they're really often quite rare um, genetic disorders that make it difficult for you to metabolize ketones. And um, so uh, I'm, I, I have the title doctor, that's an academic title for my PhD, but I'm not a physician, but you should always consult with your physician before you start a ketogenic diet for two reasons. One is you might have one of these contraindications. Uh, and if there's any physicians li listening, I've listed for you in my book, uh, so you can grab that and that'll tell you what they are. Uh, and then there are some other conditions uh, that, that might want to, like if you've had, you know, gallbladder surgery or you've had kidney issues, sometimes uh, those can be contraindications. Again, I'm not a physician, so I can't tell what's right for each individual, but that's something you want to discuss with your physician. Plus, if you're taking uh, anti-glycemic uh, drugs like metformin to draw up your blood sugar, or you're taking antihypertensive drugs to drop your blood pressure, these things what naturally drop on a ketogenic diet. So you will need- Blame for type one diabetics. Yeah, you'll need concomitant reduction in your uh, in your drug therapy, as well as perhaps more, more, more often uh, monitoring those things to make sure that you don't become hypoglycemic uh, or, or, or hypotensive, which would be worse because, you know, you could faint if you get hypotensive. We don't want people doing that. Um, but it is, you know, it's a natural diuretic. It reduces your blood volume for reasons we can discuss. Uh, and, um, and it reduces your blood sugar, obviously, because you're not consuming any extra blood sugar. So your body, when your body gets extra blood sugar and it can't burn it off, it has to store it somewhere because having excess sugar in your blood is, blood is really dangerous. That's what makes diabetes dangerous. So what your body does is say, well, we got nowhere to put it. We can't store very much of it. 
we only have we have maximum limits to the glycogen source. So the only other way to do it is to convert it into fat and store it in adipose tissue. Uh, and and so that's that's why we get fat from eating high carb diets. So it's the potatoes, rice, pasta, beer, and sugar that's making people fat. It's not butter and olive oil and good fats like that. Um, one of my favorite parts in your book was actually the uh, all the myth busting that you do, and we already mm -hmm. busted one myth that fat dietary fat will make you fat. Well, it's not as simple as that. It's mainly and primarily the carbohydrates or the excess carbohydrates and sugars that you're eating, which convert into fat. Uh, now we've busted that myth. How about some others? Um, you already mentioned the calories. Um, let's talk about fruit. Fruit is another one you mentioned in the book. Yeah, everyone knows fruits are healthy, right? I mean, before I started this journey in 2015, much later than you, um, I used to have a large bowl of fruit. I mean, even the thought of it horrifies me now as a type one diabetic because no one told me you shouldn't be eating all that sugar. Mm -hmm. And guess when I used to have a large bowl of fruit, not as a meal on its own. That's 100 yeah. grams of car a carbohydrate, 100 grams of sugar in there. Yeah. After a full dinner of rice and pasta. Right, right. I cannot imagine the hundreds of grams of carbohydrate I was eating and then yeah. off to bed. Yeah. Um, but fruit is healthy, right? <laughs> so there's all kinds of things in what you just said. Can I just start with the off to bed? Because that's an interesting point is that uh, you know, I teach anatomy and physiology and pathology, so I'm a university professor and uh, and I teach nutrition science. But uh, what what a lot of people, a lot of physicians even don't know, is that um, you know you you literally grow at night, so you tend to release the growth hormone, which is used for repair and regeneration of tissues and so on. It stimulates that good good process. That about eighty percent of that on a daily basis is released within your first sleep cycle. And, and during your first sleep cycle, you tend to go into this deep sleep, and that's where the, it gets released. Um, so uh, you want to have uh, uh, um, you want to have that growth hormone in your system during that first sleep cycle. Now, sugar in actually what it does is it stimulates the release of a hormone in your hypothalamus called growth hormone inhibiting hormone, hmm. which actually prevents the release of growth hormone. So if you eat a lot of sugar, if you have that pizza and beer and then go to bed, all that sugar goes into your blood, that stimulates the release of growth hormone inhibiting hormone, which then prevents the release of growth hormone at just the time when you want it to be released, when your body's prepared to do that repair and regeneration in that first sleep cycle. Um, so, so I, that's kind of a fun point to 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 start with in terms of uh, in terms of the, um, the 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 diurnal patterns, your day night patterns, and when you should be eating. You really shouldn't eat anything within a, at least a couple of hours of going to sleep, other than just water. Uh, certainly not any sugar, but all that. So that so now we can talk about fruit. So let's talk about fruit because I like talking about because and I do eat fruit. So not a lot. David, um, I, I, I like your explanation of the growth hormone. Sorry to 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 interrupt yeah. you there, but um, just a thought. So, how does insulin play a role in there? So, with the, with the growth hormone, because if your blood sugar is rising because you've just eaten a massive bowl of sugar before bed, your insulin is going to run high through the night. That in itself must inhibit growth hormone production, or am I uh, wrong? Uh, no, they actually work in tandem growth because because um, uh, insulin is one of the uh, is a growth factor in and of itself. It's not called a growth hormone, but uh, it, it it does stimulate protein synthesis. So you need a certain level of insulin in your blood. Um, so so that's a different story than the growth hormone story, because insulin is released when you have rises in blood sugar. Um, well, it's released actually all the time. And what you want is like a regular amount of insulin in your blood all the time that's at a low level. Um, and that insulin provides a very important role, one of which is to allow uh, your cells in your body, particularly your muscle cells, but and your fat cells to take that glucose out of the blood and, and use it uh, or store it. Um, so that's one important role. Uh, another role of insulin, which is the uh, antihypertensive effect of ketogenic diets, Insulin, and again, most 
physicians have forgotten about this when they, if, if they even learned it in medical school, but one of the, oh, insulin is a very powerful hormone. It does a lot of different things, but one of the things it does is cause the kidneys to reabsorb sodium. So reabsorbing means, you know, the, the blood goes into the kidneys, the kidneys kind of filter out everything, and then they put back in what you want to have in the blood and the rest goes into the urine. So when we say reabsorbing sodium, the salt, what we mean is the salt's been taken out of the blood by the kidneys and then it's brought back in. Now, where sodium goes, this is back to high school chemistry, you know, osmosis and diffusion and so on. Where sodium goes, water follows. So when you have a lot of insulin in your system, which happens after you eat a high sugar or high carbohydrate meal, you secrete a lot of insulin, too much, in fact. And what that does is cause too much sodium to be reabsorbed by your kidneys. And that causes too much water to be reabsorbed by your kidneys. And that water stays in your blood. It raises your blood volume. And there's a, there's a, a formula called Poisset's Law that tells us that the uh, pressure of the blood is directly proportional to the volume of the blood. Mm -hmm. So if you increase the volume of the blood by reabsorbing more water because you reabsorb more sodium because you had too much insulin in your system, then your blood volume goes up and your blood pressure goes up. Mm -hmm. So the good news on the other side of that is if you go on a ketogenic diet and you moderate your insulin levels, then more of that sodium is released in the urine and you don't have to worry about high sodium levels. You don't have to worry about sodium in your diet because you're not eating any processed foods. And the biggest source of sodium in the diet is bread, which you're not eating. Um, and so, so that can cause your blood pressure to lower considerably without any kind of drug. It's, it, it has the same effect as uh, hydrothoro, hydrochlorothiazide, which is the standard you know, generic uh, diuretic that they prescribe for high blood pressure. And all that does is make you pee more. So essentially, the ketogenic diet makes you pee more. You, you you lose your blood volume, so your blood pressure goes down. That's that's kind of kind of a, a fun part of it too. So uh, and and you know there there we go on and on. There, we haven't even started talking about what the ketones do. But but I will say, in my book on page oh, fifty seven or something like that, I present this model that I presented all over the world called um, I call it the axis of illness and. And you can you can go on you know Google or whatever go to Doctor Google you know and, and just say you know what percentage of chronic disease is caused by obesity, and it'll tell you about seventy percent of all diseases relate to obesity, including cancer. By the way, after smoking, the next biggest lifestyle issue is obesity. Um, uh, how what what percentage of um, of uh, of chronic disease are related to insulin resistance? We haven't described that yet, but again, it's about 70%. Uh, what percentage of chronic disease is related to inflammation? Well, it's about 70%. Again, cardiovascular disease being one of the main ones there. And, and Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease of the brain and so on too. So chronic inflammation is a bad thing. So those three things together, I sort of have a triangle and I call it the, the axis of illness. So obesity, insulin resistance, and inflammation. And High carbohydrate diets, for we reasons we can discuss, cause all of those things to get worse. And it doesn't matter which, they all make each other worse too. So inflammation makes insulin resistance and obesity worse. Obesity makes insulin resistance and inflammation worse and so on. And so it's kind of a vicious circle that we get, or cycle if you like, that we get rotating around. And the more carbohydrate you add onto it, the faster it spins and eventually it manifests as one of these chronic diseases. So I, I kind of believe they're all just different names for the same thing, which is metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. And I think as we go forward and we learn more about this, we're seeing that the changes that are occurring are at the mitochondrial level, those little energy converters within our cells, that a high carbohydrate makes those mitochondria uh, kind of sick and poor function, kind of like putting sugar in a gas tank of your car, right? That was always the thing. You put sugar in the gas tank of your car, it gets all gummed up and it doesn't work properly. Think about that as, as when, you're, when you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, you're kind of gumming up the mitochondria's ability to, to produce or, or to convert the energy we need to produce the ATP we need uh, efficiently and with low, um, uh, with, with low toxic effects. That's what we want to have happen. But unfortunately, ketogenic, now it, your mitochondria very happily use fats. They prefer to use fats. It's more efficient and so on. Um, uh, and they will use glucose, but uh, 
but um, it, when they do use glucose, it has a more inflammatory effect within the cells as well as systemically. So, um, so if we go back to your discussion of eating that bowl of fruit and then the insulin levels, well, yeah, insulin is released when, you, when your sugar level in your blood rises. Um, but if any level of a hormone stays high too long, and, and it's a very powerful hormone, it starts to have ill effects. So if you look at any endocrinology book, it's just, what's the gland? What's the hormone? What happens if you don't have enough? And what happens if you have too much? And so too much insulin is unhealthy, very unhealthy. And, and one of the things it does is it desensitizes the cells that would normally respond to insulin like well, brain cells, but but also muscle cells and fat cells, it desensitizes them. So they're not absorbing as much sugar from the blood as they should um, uh, when the insulin levels are too high for too long. And I, I, I kind of use an analogy of like, um, you know, sometimes people as they get older, they start losing their hearing. And so what do they do? Well, they turn the TV up louder, right? And of course that loud noise just makes their hearing worse again. So then it needs to be louder and louder. So Think of that like the insulin signal. It's getting louder and louder, but the cells are getting kind of deaf. So you need more and more insulin release to have the same effect, to remove that sugar from the blood. And that creates more insulin resistance. So that, again, this vicious cycle happens, uh, but it's reversible. And again, we can we can reverse insulin resistance. So we can measure insulin resistance, something called HOMA IR, we use clinically, and we can measure that. And we can, we can reverse that in a couple of weeks, typically on a ketogenic diet. So that that reverses all of that uh, that harm that's been done, and 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 then the inflammation part of it, of course, uh, high sugar in your blood is also highly inflammatory. Uh, and the other thing that's highly inflammatory in in the Western diet or the um, the the standard global diet, as you called it, uh, are seed oils. I would definitely avoid seed oils because they're very high in omega six fatty acids, and those are highly inflammatory. Whereas you know, I was talking about grass-fed butter. Of course, it's the cows that are grass-fed, not the butter. But when the cows are grass-fed, it's very high omega-3, which is an anti-inflammatory form of the omega fatty acid. Um, so you'd, I, I would definitely, like if you're looking at grass-fed butter versus, you know, some crappy margarine stuff, the margarine is pretty toxic because it's inflammatory, um, as are most seed oils. And, and what they're using in the fast foods that you were saying people get all over the world now, it's the same sort of diet people are eating all these fast. It's all like linseed oil, cotton oil, canola oil. They're all just cheap, inexpensive seed oils that are really highly inflammatory. So there you go. So then you get obesity, you get insulin resistance, uh, and and then we end, end up with chronic disease levels uh, that, are, that are basically uh, bringing the whole healthcare system in the West to its knees. I mean, we can't, we can't service the number of people that are getting chronic disease right now. David, let's come back to the uh, that bowl of fruit. Right? How about all those antioxidants? They're supposed to be healthy. Yeah. And all yeah so I mentioned uh, and yeah. vitamin C and uh, you know all the rest. The antioxidant story is that um, uh, you know Bill Bryson writes about that in his the Human Body: The User's Guide. It's kind of interesting. The, the evidence for that is actually pretty thin that antioxidants are necessary. We have our own antioxidants, um, you know, peroxidase, so on in our cells, uh, superoxidase, dismutase, and so on that, that our cells produce that, um, that, that, that prevent the oxidation from having an effect. Whether, whether you know, all these vitamins and stuff provide additional um, um, service there, I, I don't think it's convincing which is probably why a lot of these studies where they look at the effects of particular vitamins usually don't show much of a difference, mm -hmm. uh, but they are necessary, of course. You need a healthy amount of vitamins. So I do eat berries. So typically strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries, be not so much because of the antioxidants, but the other phytochemicals in there uh, that seem to be beneficial. Some of them, you know, uh, uh, stimulate um, uh, some of the uh, neuronal growth hormones and that sort of thing. And, and they probably do have some beneficial effect. Plus they kind of taste plenty. You know, I mean, you want to have a varied diet. You don't want to just be eating eggs all the time. You probably could, but um, so yeah, but, but think about what a fruit is. So people think, oh, fruit, it's natural. It must be healthy, right? It comes from a plant, but a fruit is something that the plant produces. I, I can sum it up. Fruits are because plants can't run. 
So animals can move. That's why animals are animals. They move around. So when animals want to reproduce and create more humans or more rabbits or whatever, they can run around and occupy new eco uh, ecological niches in the environment. Plants can't do that. They're rooted. So they need to borrow uh, animals to spread seeds around. And sometimes they spread pollen in the wind. That's one method. And sometimes they use water and sometimes they use animals. And so how do you get an animal to, to move its seed around? Well, you got to get the animal to eat it. And then the seed has to be protected enough so it'll pass through the animal's digestive system. And then it gets, you know, pooped out somewhere else with some fertilizer uh, some distance away. So it's not competing with its parents. So that's what that's what fruits are. They're not designed to make humans healthy. They're not designed to create antioxidants to make us healthy. The plant is completely using us to eat its fruit and spread its seeds. And it doesn't care if we live two seconds after we do that. It just <laughs> has no interest whatsoever. It does is not interested in our chronic health or disease at all. Uh, so um, what a plant does to get us to eat is make it taste good. And since oils are expensive, the easiest way to make something taste good is to put a sugar in it because we react to that because we taste it as energy and we act positively. And the sweetest sugar is fructose. So fructose is not naturally occurring in animals. It's only from plants. And fructose combines with glucose, which animals do use, uh, but we can't really, we, we metabolize fructose, but we metabolize it in our liver. It's, we sort of detoxify it. But fructose and glucose make sucrose and that's what we call table sugar. And of course, table sugar comes from plants, from sugar cane or from sugar beets or whatever. Um, but uh, so the fruit has that sugar that tastes good. So we'll want to eat it because it tastes good. And, and, you know, we get some nutrients out of it. And then we spread the seeds around. But there's no interest in health there at all. But what we've done through uh, agriculture is we've taken fruits that were a little bit sweet. Uh, most natural occurring wild versions of fruits were small and pretty tart, a little bit sweet, but digestible. Um, but what we've done is made these like, what's a honey crisp apple? I don't know, it's 5,000 kinds of apples and they're all super sweet. You know, oranges, super sweet oranges, super sweet grapes, super sweet figs and apricots and peaches. It's all, they, we've designed them all to be super sweet <laughs> because humans will eat them and they'll buy them. And that's, again, the people doing that are not really interested in our health. They're interested in selling you fruit so that they can make money. And that's what they live on. There's nothing wrong with that, I suppose. But but for that reason, because they're deliberately designed to be super sweet, they have a lot of sugar and way more sugar than you should be eating. So 100 grams of sugar a day, the, the maximum your body can probably metabolize is maybe 25 grams of fructose uh, without any health consequences. So since fructose is half of sucrose, if you're getting 100 grams of sugar in a bowl, then you're already way over your daily allotment that your liver can actually metabolize. So that fructose is going to create all kinds of problems. Um, and when we metabolize fructose, it does about five different things that are really unhealthy. Um, it raises your uric acid levels. It causes de novo lipogenesis, so you produce no, more fats from the fructose. It affects our brains almost like you know, cocaine, it has an addictive effect on the brain. Um, uh, of course, it increases sugar level in the blood and it increases the uh, insulin resistance as well. It doesn't necessarily raise your blood sugar, but it does increase insulin resistance. And that's, and, and when you're considering, you know, the average person in North America eats, uh, you know, something like 50 pounds of sugar a year, you know, like a pound of sugar a week. And that and they go, and, and people go, oh, I don't want to eat that. It's full of chemicals. I go, what do you think sugar is? It's a big bag of chemicals. And half of that chemical in there is toxic to your liver. And, but, but you think, oh, we have this in our culture. Oh, we call each other sweetie. Oh, that's, oh, be sweet. You know, well, that's like, we have holidays, like, like, uh, I guess Valentine's Day is coming up where we give people sweet things. We have sweet things at Christmas. We have birthday cake and our birth. Everything we do is reward people with sugar. And so we have this huge social consciousness that sugar is a good thing that you get rewarded for when you're doing good. When it's really, what you're doing is giving people poison. <laughs> it's making them sick and giving them chronic disease. And if you're diabetic, of course, you have to be really careful with that. David, one more myth to bust, and then I'm going to come back to uh, something you alluded to um, uh, earlier. So, um, well, it would be easy. People say it would be easy if we just eat, you know, everything available to us, but everything in moderation. 
what on earth does that mean? What is moderation? <laughs> yeah, you you know, moderation. I, I think I think that's just a little. It's 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 a myth we like to use to to rationalize or justify a lousy diet. You know, ah, it's everything in moderation. One of the things we've learned when we do these retrospective studies and so on, which are are not particularly effective, in, is people are really bad judges of what they eat. They don't, and, and if you ask people to record what they eat, they start eating differently right away because now they're more aware of what they're eating. But people kind of eat on impulse. They don't really look at the amount that they're eating um, or how much. Like an apple, for example, you know, uh, my wife and I will eat an apple, but we literally, an apple will last us all week. We'll get like a quarter of an apple and have a little slice kind of like candy um, as, uh, you know, just a little something that's a little bit sweet after dinner with some cheese or something like that. But nobody eats like half an apple. People eat the whole apple and then you're getting way too much sugar and so on and so forth. So so people are really bad at judging how much they eat, what they eat. Um, there are some places like um, Michigan where the average person eats one meal every day in a fast food restaurant. Um, and that's that's like fast food, like, you know, the usual burger places. So if you consider some people never go there, there's some people that are eating two or three meals a day. That's where they're getting all their nutrition from. And they don't have any idea what the nutrient value of that food is. Uh, and, and even if they label it, even they, oh, it has this much salt, this much calories. Do you think people really care about that? They just, they eat it because it's fast and it tastes good and it satisfies them in the short term. But um, like, I, I can't remember the last time I went into one of those places. I mean, I'll eat a burger, but I just tell them to hold the bun. I'll eat the meat and the cheese and bacon and mushrooms and, you know, lettuce and tomato, but I just don't eat the bun. That's fine. <laughs> but I like I like grass fed beef, too, which is uh, much better. So I don't mind paying the premium for that. So so there is a myth that, you know, everything in moderation, I think it's just people are just justifying bad habits. And th what they're saying is, that, well, I, if again, like we we're saying earlier, well, if I have a little bit of this, it's OK. It's OK to have a couple of cookies. But then. Um, you know, we eat differently too. When I was a child, um, dessert was not something we had every night after dinner. We, we would have dessert maybe once a week. You know, mom on the weekend would make pie or something and you get a bit of pie or maybe some cake, but it wasn't an every night thing, but now it's an every meal thing. Yeah. And, you know, there's desserts with lunch and desserts with dinner and, and it's all sweet stuff. And then if you look at what people eat for breakfast, you know, orange juice is just the same sugar load as Coca-Cola with orange flavoring. Uh, cereal is horrible stuff. It's grains full of highly inflammatory stuff and, and, and probably made in like with bad oils and that sort of thing. And they throw a few vitamins in there and tell you it's good for you and call it NutraSweet or something, you know, whatever. Anything that says Nutra on it probably isn't good for you or if it comes in a package and then maybe you have toast that's bread that's high you know or, or you yogurt like i do eat yogurt i think it's really healthy but i eat the very high fat low sugar yogurt unsweetened and then i use my own sweetener um if i want to uh but but uh, but the the other yogurt has just tons of sugar in it so you know people eat that stuff for breakfast they're just loading themselves up with sugar which makes this huge insulin surge which makes you insulin resistance over time but also sucks way too much sugar out of your blood so then about 10 o'clock you're super hungry and what do you want you want something carby so you eat you know a scone or a muffin or something which is just more carbs and then you wait till lunch where you have like noodles and bread and you know sandwiches and then you're and then dinner you have pasta and rice and so people do that and they do, if you do it day over day our bodies are amazing at adapting to that but we can't adapt forever and after a while your pancreas just gets worn out and you know you you just can't tolerate that much carbohydrate so you start gaining weight you start you know putting on you get a belly you start putting on fat uh you start to hurt which is the inflammation part of it uh, and if you want to know how you know if you're getting insulin resistance, the, the one way to notice that is your brain will feel foggy. So if you're starting to get brain fog, that's not an aging thing. That's an inflammation thing. Uh, that's uh, Sorry, it's, a, it's an insulin resistant thing. Well, and an inflammation thing for that matter, too. So, so um, uh, you, those things that happen that we say, oh, it's just part of aging, they do not have to happen. I mean, you're going to get some gray hairs like I have. You're going to get a few wrinkles if you've been out in the sun like I have. But you don't have to get obese. You don't have to hurt. You don't have to get diabetes and heart disease. Your blood pressure does not have to go up. Your blood sugar does not have to go up. Your lipids do not have to get out of range. 
All of that is happening primarily because of diet. And and if I can add to that, in, in 2017, uh, in the in the journal, um, The Lancet, which is a British journal, uh, we both, you lived in the UK too, right? I think we both lived in the UK. We both were in Cambridge around. Yeah, both in Cambridge. Oh, great. Around the yeah. same time. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, we talked about that. I was on Panton Street there. Yeah, so great place to live. Um, uh, so, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I got distracted now. I started thinking about Panton Street, my favorite pub there that I would go to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss Cambridge too. I really miss, yeah. miss the city. In 2017, the journal Lancet mm -hmm. produced a study. It was the global burden of chronic disease. So things like COVID wouldn't be in there. Well, we didn't have COVID then, but uh, that's an acute disease. So chronic disease is that cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and so on. Um, so if you look at the cause of that in terms of lifestyle, they went all over the world and said, okay, what is the major cause of that? And you would look at things like smoking. Yes, a huge problem. Like you absolutely shouldn't smoke. Everybody knows you shouldn't smoke. That's a huge problem. Uh, alcohol use and abuse, uh, overconsumption of alcohol will cause disease, no question of that. Same with drug abuse. Um, sedentary behavior and lack of exercise, which are two related but different things. Those are also big factors. People that don't move around uh, tend to get higher rates of chronic disease. But greater than all of those is nutrition. And it's greater than all of those combined, combined. So what's on the end of your fork at a meal is more important than whether you're smoking, drinking too much, you know, abusing drugs, not getting exercise, stressed out. The most important lifestyle decision you make every day is on the end of your fork. And and uh, one of the other myths is, you know, oh, you know, if I eat too much, I'll just I'll exercise more. Well, I'm, I'm a kinesiology professor. We have a, a, a saying, which is you can't outrun your fork. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating crappy food, all the exercise in the world is not going to correct that crappy diet for you. It Sure, it may burn some calories, but it's not going to correct an unhealthy diet. So ex you can't exercise away crappy food. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, David, earlier on, you were, were talking about fruit and you mentioned something about their addictive um, side. Now, in your book, I think it's somewhere in the first couple of chapters you refer to something uh called collective our collective carb addiction mm -hmm. and i was happy that that book actually was published a few years ago now mm -hmm. i'm so happy and pleased to read those words because i think you are ahead of your time it's only now it's only now that we are hearing about carbohydrate addiction more and more on social media search mm -hmm. and and in literature as well a few years ago it was a taboo you couldn't even say it yeah you couldn't even use mm -hmm. the word the phrase so uh, let's talk about you know what exactly you mean by collective carbohydrate addiction yeah yeah, so, uh, or, you know, we call them carboholics too, people that just love carbohydrates, right? They just love bread and, you know, cookies and cakes and pastries. And, you know, we, we have a, a, a radio show uh, that plays nationally in Canada here uh, and on the West Coast anyway. And I just call it the sugar show because all they do is they tell it's on Sunday mornings, you know, all they talk about is baking stuff all the time. And and you can bake ketogenic stuff that doesn't have the high carbohydrate load by using, um, you know, nut flours and things like that. Uh, but carbohydrate addiction, well, I, I think from what the science would say is there are some aspects of fructose which affect the same sort of dopamine receptor systems that cause addiction. So I would probably say it's more the sugar that's addictive, but any kind of behavior can become addictive too. So, um, uh, and I think we all have a tendency to eat more carbohydrates in the fall. You know, as the days get shorter and colder, we tend to eat more carbohydrates. Um, I, I kind of think of, you know, if you think of your metabolism like a campfire, um, the carbohydrates are kind of like the kindling uh, and, and the logs are kind of like the fats. So really, you want to get the logs going and have them burning away. 
But what people like to do is because kindling tastes better. So they just like throw keep throwing kindling on the fire all the time, which makes the fire burn too hot, of course. So I would say, yeah, collective car. I think socially we uh, associate high carbohydrates foods with good things, with positive things like birthdays and, you know, and Easter and Easter bunnies and, you know, Christmas and and cookies. And it's it's a culture and it's not just Western culture. I mean, I think all cultures kind of do that uh, to some degree, um, uh, perhaps not. Inuit culture because it wouldn't be a normal thing there, um, but of course culture is all they're all fluid and change from time to time. But I think it's the cultural uh, expectation that carbohydrates are a significant part of what makes food enjoyable. And in fact, the only there's only really one flavor to carbohydrate, and that's sweet. If you if you taste just plain starch. Uh, it, it's it's very much like cardboard. It has no real flavor, um, and and it's only the sweet part that's in there. All the rest of flavor, which is what gives us pleasure, is in the fats. It's the compounds that dissolve in the oils that we taste on our tongue that create those amazing sensations. Of course, the other one would be salt, right? Mm. Um, and 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 salt is also it's found in water, but it's not that's not a macronutrient. So. Salt is a, is a is a is a mineral as opposed to uh, you know carbon compound. Um, so I think both there's an addictive quality to fructose which we're learning about. I think it's probably too early to conclude that it is it is an addictive substance like nicotine would be or like cocaine would be, but it does seem to trigger similar pathways. And when you withdraw people from sugar that eat a lot of it, they do undergo withdrawal symptoms, which is another indication that it may have addictive properties. They get headaches, they get sometimes even some delirium and uh, so on. Um, the rest of the carbohydrates, I think, is more just habitual. And so, so one of the things that I encourage in the book is for people to just say, okay, this is what you've been eating. And the reason, the reason you've been eating what you're eating it, it is just that. It's available everywhere all the time. It's packaged, it's convenient, and it tastes really good. And it's easy to get. You don't have to go hunting and gathering to get this stuff that tastes amazing. I can, I live in downtown Vancouver. I can walk two blocks and go to like 30 different restaurants that'll, that'll, that'll give me something within 10 seconds that I can shove in my mouth and eat. That's not normal human behavior. Usually we have to, you know, make fishing nets, you know, and cook things and all that sort of stuff. So it's too convenient. So because it's so convenient, we will eat the things that we like to eat that taste good. Uh, or we'll eat the things that we think are good for us if they don't taste quite so good, but we have the belief system that they're good for us. So when the governments are telling us carbohydrates are good for you, what you shouldn't eat are fats. Those are bad for you. And I think the reason you were saying that a few years ago we couldn't say that, uh, certainly in the dietitian world, you couldn't say that because it was contrary to what the governments were saying was a healthy diet. So if the governments are hearing people that they're you know, certifying as dietitians or something saying that carbohydrates are bad for you, they're going, no, no, but we're telling them that, that they're good for them. They should be eating those. So you can't tell them that they're bad. But I think what's happening now is, I mean, it's very, you know what, you know what we're doing? We're actually bypassing them. People, this is why it's so great that you have your, your show, your podcast, your vodcast, because we're talking directly to people who are interested in this. We're bypassing government regulators who are ignoring the science of nutrition that's been around for now 20, 25 years that we've known high carbohydrates diets cause problems. We've known that ketogenic diets are beneficial. Um, and the media follows along too. And I think partly because most of the people in the media and the editorial boards, they don't have a science background. They come more from the humanities. And so they don't really understand it. So, I mean, I was talking to a woman yesterday from uh, you know a, um, a supplement company and talking about you know could I was trying to help them develop a, a keto some ketogenic supplements that would be useful. Um, so you're saying yeah, but you know they they, they think keto is just a fad. And I go well, if science is a fad, then I guess it is, right? So, but there are lots of fad diets. Ketogenic diets are not a fad diet. Ketogenic diets are not a calorie short-term calorie restricted diet. They're intended to be a permanent lifestyle change where you shift from buying and making and eating foods that are high in carbohydrates to buying, making and eating foods that are high in fats. 
And when you do that, you'll see your health improve, you'll see your general demeanor improve, your mood improves over about 10 to 12 weeks typically. Um, and, and that's what we have to do is just get that message through to people and just say, just try it. You know, talk to your physician, have a go, see how you feel. If it doesn't work for you, whatever. But eight out, seven out of eight people, that's again, back of the envelope, but it actually works pretty close. Seven out of eight people will definitely benefit from a ketogenic diet. David, I'm glad you mentioned the media just playing along and they don't, um, they cover nutrition, obviously, they cover health, human health, without any deep understanding of, of the science. I was uh, recently, um, actually it is on YouTube, I, I, I'll share the link with you later. Um, I saw this uh, panel, a, a journalist, it was a morning show on television, and one of them was a dietitian. They were talking about the ketogenic diet and how it's supposed to just be this fat diet, right? Mm. Obviously the journalists in there have no idea of diet. And someone uh, said that uh, it's uh, it's starvation, starvation diet, which obviously is scientifically completely untrue. But the dietitian among them, there was one dietitian. She said, well, that's extremely unhealthy. Ketosis, she was talking about ketosis being very unhealthy because you're risking uh what we in the diabetic world would call ketoacidosis. So she was yes. saying something like, oh, it's potentially fatal. And I, I, I'm i not of scientific background. My background is linguistics, right? But I know enough to have shouted, at them, like, no, you're mixing nutritional ketosis with diabetic ketoacidosis. They're completely different contexts completely different states, physiological states. Mm. How could you come on, well, you know, on television and just make a claim like that? Well, I don't know. Infuriating. I, I, it, you know, we're reaching a point in our cultural development where it's the end of truth. You know, it's, it's hard to know what's true out there. The, the internet is so gummed up with junk. And then it, it, well, what shocks me is you're right. There's not much journalism and journalistic integrity there if people are just allowed to say things that are that are fundamentally not true. So so nutritional ketosis would be a range of ketones. You know, you could I, I mine has been as high as eight, uh, um, but that's pretty high. But, you know, usually it's around two or a half to two. But ketoacidosis is like an or, order of magnitude, like five or ten times higher than that. And ketoacidosis is something that happens to uh, diabetics um, uh, that is sort of a, a, a pre-stage before diabetic coma. And it is very dangerous. It's the acid part of it, ketoacidosis. But, but ketosis is completely natural. I mean, babies are in ketosis in the womb. Babies, they're born in ketosis. As they breastfeed, they stay in ketosis as long as they're breastfed. Ketosis is the natural human state. So it's that that uh, nutritional ketosis simply means that you're restricting carbohydrate enough to allow the natural levels of ketones to exist in your blood. Ketoacidosis is a very dangerous thing, but they're completely different. And that's like saying heart is the same thing as heart attack, right? <laughs> so ketone is a good thing. It's a wonderful, amazing signaling molecule and, a, and an energetic fuel and so on. And ketones are great things ketoacidosis, it's like there's too much of anything. So they will say, oh, it's okay to, to, to have too much sugar in your blood, which we know is toxic, but we don't want you to have any ketone in your blood because there's this thing called ketos, ke, uh, ketoacidosis if you, if, if, if you have diabetes. And that, you know, it's a lot of physicians think that because, you know, I teach students that get into medical school or sort of pre-med students and and, uh, uh, we, you know, the average physician, by the way, gets three to five hours of nutritional training in medical school, you know, so you can tell them the macronutrients, the micronutrients, and then, you know, this is how you prescribe uh, a dietitian. That's what all they learn. They're not experts in nutrition. So it always kind of makes me roll my eyes when I hear physicians talking about nutrition, because that's not their training. Their training is in medicine, which is treating disease. Nutrition is preventing disease.
Mm-hmm. And and so I, I'm shocked that that I'm, I'm not surprised, but I'm dismayed that that would happen. And one of the things we should point out to your to your listeners is that in some places, dietitians are not allowed to prescribe ketogenic diets. Like if they're working in a hospital, for example, they're not allowed to do that. Uh, and in some states, it's still illegal to do that. You can be charged criminally, which is unbelievable that you'd be charged criminally for telling people they should eat uh, what is a normal human diet. <laughs> I just find that amazing. Yeah, that's that. So let's, let's, okay. So, um, oh, oh, with coming, I mean, I'm well familiar with ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis would uh, also present, of course, uh, well, ketoacidosis presents with uh, high, very high, abnormally high blood sugars. And mm, yes. most, most of the time, super low insulin levels. Um, yeah lower than physiologically acceptable um so so yes it is a fatal condition however nutritional ketosis as david explained is a completely different different state now how about ketosis and starvation (laughs) well i don't know i mean uh, every other diet out there is a calorie restricted diet and that's starvation because if you're restricting calories if you're getting people to eat less and again calories a unit of energy not a unit of weight but if you're restricting calories, A, it's really hard to get full nutrition, to get all the nutrients that you need when you're restricting calories. And two, you can't maintain that. So it has to be short term because you would eventually, wither, you would starve yourself to death. Um, so every other diet other than a ketogenic diet is a starvation diet. Ketogenic diets do not restrict calories. You, can, you eat when you're hungry and you stop when you're full. And I've been on a ketogenic diet again for 15 years. And I, I lost, I went from, I said it was like 177 in pounds. Um, uh, you know, they do stone in England when we were there, but uh, 177 in pounds. And uh, and I dropped to about 150-ish. And I today I weighed in, I was 148.7, 15 years later, right? So I don't gain any, like I'll gain a pound or two and lose a pound or two. But as long as I stay on a ketogenic diet, I, I'm not going to zero. I haven't starved to death. <laughs> I get full nutrition. As I said, my blood work shows I'm in absolutely perfect health. So all of that stuff is just nonsense, but it makes me wonder why they're saying that. So they're either saying it because they're naive and they just don't know any better, or they're saying it because they've been telling people something different and they don't want to admit that they were wrong. And so, you know, if you do, and thank you, by the way, for for buying my book and reading it. And if you do read my book, the very start of my book is, oh, my God, I've been teaching wrong stuff to my students for 30 years and I have to apologize to them. Because what I did as a scientist was terrible. I I didn't I came into nutrition science. I didn't start that way. But I I was just teaching that the, the standard diet, you know, high carb, you know, low fat diet. That was the healthy thing. I did that for decades until I realized that that was completely wrong. And it was it was a paradigm or a model that was never proven. It was just thought of, made sense, but never proven. And when they try and prove it, it never works out that way. So I had to apologize in the book. I said, I'm sorry for those decades of students that I taught the wrong stuff to. So now I'm teaching them the right stuff. <laughs> so that would be the yeah. second thing. They just don't want to admit that they're wrong. Or are thirdly, you David, are there are- you able to teach your students about the ketogenic diet or or do you have to follow certain curriculum nah. guidelines no i'm a sci- i'm a um that, that's academic freedom so right. uh and i could argue the science till the cows come home so i don't think anybody is going to challenge me on that one um you know if i was a licensed physician or a dietitian i could probably be in trouble but in a way i'm, I'm looking for trouble because i'm an ad- i'm advocating for change and you have to kind of rattle a few mobiles to make that change happen right so, so I, I don't, I don't mind doing that. But the, the third reason, so it's either naivety, um, or they're just protecting themselves. They won't admit that they're wrong, which is really hard for most people. Or is it malicious? You know, because there are definitely people that are out there that are paid by organizations that are into this plant-based stuff, or they're, or they work for the processed food industry or they work for i mean if you look at what coca-cola for example you know they sell poison to children right this coca-cola is full of sugar sugar is poisonous and they, they advertise it to children so that to me constitutes selling poison to children it's kind of like selling cigarettes to people you know we used to say oh it's good for you it clears your lungs you know 
So that was wrong. And selling sugar to people is also wrong um, because we know now that sugar is toxic. So that's that's wrong thing to do. And the, but they still make money from it. And so you'll see these organizations like the one Michelle Obama got into, which was funded by Coke to get people active again. They go, see, we're trying to get people healthy again. But, you know, after you have that workout, you want a nice Coca-Cola to go after it, which has, by the way, twice as much fructose as would be healthy to, to eat. Um, but as I said, you know, what, one of the things you're doing is getting past the advertisers, past that gunk, talking science to the end consumer. So what's the most popular drink from Coca-Cola now is the sugar-free Coca-Cola, zero mm -hmm. sugar. Mm -hmm. So people are hearing it. So our governments might not be saying, they won't say you should stop eating sugar. They should say that. They just won't because the people that will never admit they're wrong are bureaucrats. Bureaucrats never admit they're wrong. And if they do, it wasn't their fault. You know, they just won't do that. The great thing about science is we always know we could be wrong. And so if you're a good scientist, you go, yeah, you know, faced with this new evidence, I was working with the wrong model. There's now a new one. That one makes more sense. The evidence supports that. So I'll reject the old model I had and I'll now accept the new model. That's how science works. So scientists that are good can accept that, they have, that, that they're wrong all the time. Uh, but what we're trying to do is find what's right, what the evidence supports. What bureaucrats do is they just stick to whatever they're saying. <laughs> it's, well, they refuse to budge because they just don't have that flexibility of thinking. And they're just protecting their careers, I think, or whatever. So, so it is a challenge, I have to say. Um, you know, it is tiring. It is fatiguing to be constantly... It's great that there's more and more people like you out there that are trying to help get the right word out, get the healthy information out to people um, and, uh, and and bypassing those media channels and those, um, you know, bureaucratic channels that are telling people to eat the wrong things and the advertisers that are advertising whatever sells and what sells is what people like to eat. What they like to eat is what tastes good, whether it's good for them or not. So it's a challenge. David, one last question to wrap this up with. Um, so obviously we talked about the ketogenic diet for weight loss and an improvement of general health. Um, where do supplements come in this? I mean, you do cover it in the book. So this is why I'm bringing it up. Would someone need to take further supplements if they have a well-formulated ketogenic diet? Uh, theoretically, no, you know, yeah, because we, you know, we're, if you're eating a truly well-formulated ketogenic diet, it should provide all the nutrition you have, but that can be a challenge for people um, to get all of the nutrients and so on. You have to, you know, really to, to, to eat a truly well-balanced diet, you pretty much have to have a degree in nutrition to know what to buy and what's in what foods and that sort of thing. It's, it's not easy to do and trusting you know, for-profit uh, multinational food companies to give you what's healthy for you, I think is the wrong way to go. Um, so it does, it's it's good to get um, a sufficient amount of supplements. And there are some things, you know, there's only about three to 5% of people get enough potassium in their diet, for example. Um, uh, most people that eat processed foods get too much sodium, but when you're on a ketogenic diet, you need to add a little bit more. So one of the supplements that, um, is necessary and you usually notice it when you're adapting is are just the salts. So magnesium, calcium, uh, sodium, potassium. Uh, so you probably, like I take um, uh, magnesium uh, bisglycinate every night before I go to bed. Uh, it makes magnesium is really important and I think it's uh, beneficial. Is it lacking in a ketogenic diet? Probably not, but I think an excess magnesium is good um, because your kidneys will sort it out. Uh, if there's too much, you'll just pee it out. Um, and then there's things like, uh, you know, at the Cancer Research Center where I work, uh, we've in, we've uh, demonstrated, at least in animal models, that um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids are very good for reducing your risk of inflammation and cancer and so on. Are we uh, talking so, about fish oils? Yeah, fish oils. Yeah, yeah. So those are the omega-3 fish oils. Uh, we'll, we'll avoid the long names for them. Um, but the, uh, yeah, fish oil-based omega-3 fatty acids uh, those are good. And then, you know, there's the other vitamins. Uh, the, I think vitamin D is probably something that for those of us living in the North, uh, that are light skinned, like you and I, you know, we probably are not getting enough vitamin D. Uh, so at least in the winter, it's probably good to supplement with vitamin D. 
Um, and there are others. I mean, there's there, there's a lot of biohackers out there that play around with things. I mean, you know, there's things like glutathione, which if you want to talk about antioxidants, that's probably one that really does work at the cellular level. Uh, glutathione. Um, and um, and then there's things that you can use in your foods like cinnamon and turmeric are, are anti-inflammatory um, uh, spices that you can put on your food that actually have quite a powerful effect. So it's not necessarily always coming in a tablet. Sometimes it's just eating the right foods or, or using uh, spices and so on. But so that so the short answer is uh, you shouldn't need to supplement if you actually are able to get a completely well balanced ketogenic diet. But because it's hard to do that in this day and age, you know, our days are pretty busy. Uh, I think it's wise to supplement with some things to make sure that you're you're getting enough. And and when you're adapting to a ketogenic diet, I think the you know we have an expression you have to get the salts right, and and your body's really good at regulating salts. So the better things just give your body more than it needs and then let your kidneys sort it out, which they will. Um, and you do need more sodium when you're on a ketogenic diet because it's a very low sodium diet and you don't retain that sodium because of the low insulin levels. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I, I, uh, as I say, I wouldn't be talking to supplement companies about helping them to, um, formulate better, uh, better supplements for people on ketogenic diets if I didn't believe that. Um, but it's not, it's not a ban, it's not an easy fix. Just because you take your vitamin C and your vitamin B, again, it's like you can't outrun your fork. Uh, you, you, you're not going to out supplement your diet either. Just taking a bunch of supplements if the rest of your diet is crappy is not going to do any, do you any good. You, it, it, it only works if you already have a, a, a well-balanced, healthy diet first. Perfect message to end this with. <laughs> Yeah, that's really great. Sorry, I, I, it's yeah, been great yeah. chatting with you. I mean, it, the, again, the opportunity to to chat with people um, about this. If I can mention the, uh, if they want to have a look at my book, it, there's a, a website uh, that we put up. Uh, my wife and I wrote the book. She's a journalist, so she helped me get the get the tone right for the general public. So I, I'd like to think she helped me make it very engaging, and it's not very sciencey. I, I probably talk way more science today than I do in the book. Um, but the first part kind of explains why a ketogenic diet works and the second part shows you how to adopt it safely and what things to measure and and you know what to talk about with your doctor and so our website is just biodiet all one word dot org not dot com biodiet dot org uh and and they can you know the, the book's available in like audio or ebook or hard copy whatever they like they can go and order it through the website there's a links at the bottom uh, and if they ever see me in person, I do a lot of public speaking and so on. I'd be very happy to sign books for people too, as I would for you. I, I hope to see you in in uh, in Toronto. Um, uh, my wife and I are going to be there, I think, in uh, June at some point. So uh, I'll let you know. I'll be here in June. Um, yeah, it'd be great to meet you. Planning to leave in July. Yeah, I, I look forward to it. Okay. Um, so. For my listeners, I will put all of David's links below mm. so you can directly buy. I think I bought my copy on uh, Amazon. Um, I have the Kindle version. So mm. uh, so I'll put all the uh, direct links below. And of course, you can email David if you have any questions or if you would like to invite David to your podcast. He's uh, always happy sure. to come and talk about um, the ketogenic diet. Dr. David Harper, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Neri. It was a pleasure to be on your show. Those are great questions, great conversation. And as I say, I look forward to uh, to meeting you in person. And, and I'll, I'll sign off the way I like to sign my books, which is to wish you health and happiness. Perfect. Thank you. Bye for now.